Well, it's good to be back with you all. It's been uh, a few weeks now that I've been out of the saddle because my wife Jill and I just had our first uh, child, a little boy, three weeks ago. Thank you. Your applause reminds me how small my contribution was in that whole process, but uh, there we go. Uh, yeah, three weeks ago, Dr. Chung, who's here, uh, delivered our baby boy 10 pounds, 6 ounces. Um, he looked nothing like either of us, and we named him Declan after the first missionary to Ireland. Uh, Declan Jude McFadden is his name, and he's a delight. And it's been sort of staggering as a new parent to see the love and support that you guys as a family have poured out on this little kid before he was even an air breather. Uh, it's really remarkable and an amazing picture to us of God's love for all of us as his kids. Uh, it's really overwhelming. So thank you uh, from Jill and me. Parenting, um, many of you know, is an adjustment. Um, <laughs> those of you who don't know me, uh, a month ago I had a full head of thick, <laughs> luxurious, wavy, platinum blonde hair. It's tough. Uh, you get to know things about your spouse and about yourself um, that are new. I've learned uh, new things about my wife, uh, new depths to her compassion. Not that she wasn't compassionate before, let the record show. Um, but just as a husband, I've uh, tried to give her more opportunities to show forgiveness than, than uh, compassion. I've also learned about myself new things, like I love lactation cookies. Just to be clear, uh, these are cookies that help moms make milk, not made from mom's milk. But I've, I've eaten enough of these now that I'm at risk of lactating myself. Uh, but they're really delicious. I commend them to you all. Um, Jill especially has done a lot of reflecting since we're in the, the church calendar season now called Advent, which is about the coming of Jesus, reflecting on those themes in light of, of being a new mom. And it's been a lot of fun for her and quite poignant. For example, she's reflected on the fact that uh, at night, as little Declan is lying there in the, the vast expanse of his ACOG certified bassinet uh, with nary a comfy, comfortable blanket or, or comforting toy there for him, since you're not supposed to have those because they might smother him, when he cries out, she hears him. And she knows that she's going to be there to rescue him in a matter of seconds, just a moment. But for him, crying out there, he doesn't know whether she's hurt. He doesn't know whether she's coming. For him, those seconds could seem like centuries. He's waiting. Left to his three-week-old memory to try to remember that in the past when he has cried out, the rescuer has come. And apart from that, just to cry out, which he does. I'll let you know. <laughs> um, so that's sort of what we do in Advent. We're crying out for a rescuer. We're placing ourselves in the sandals of historical Israel as they waited for the Messiah to arrive. We're looking backwards to the arrival of Jesus, God's Savior, 2,000 years ago, but we're also longing and looking forward to and waiting for him to come again. This morning, uh, we're going to follow the pattern that we've been using for the past couple weeks of digging into an Old Testament passage which sort of prefigures uh, the arrival of Jesus. So this morning, we're going to be in Exodus chapter 14. Um, it's on page 63 in the red Bibles under the seat in front of you. It's kind of fun to be in a page 63. I mean, that's early. It's good stuff. Um, so you can dig that out, pull it up on your phone if you like. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 14 and then 26 through 29, and I'll fill in some of the gaps. This story, though, many of you will know is the, the story of the Exodus, when God rescued his people miraculously and possibly across the Red Sea, this expanse of water. And this episode became the, the, the concrete foundation for all subsequent biblical definitions of salvation. In fact, spoiler alert, verse 13 in our passage today says, this is, the, this is the salvation of the Lord. Salvation, and I think the Red Bible say deliverance of the Lord. The Hebrew word there, many of you will know, is Yeshua. The very name that the angel told Mary and Joseph to name their son. 
Yeshua, Jesus, the Lord's salvation. This episode becomes definitive of salvation for biblical Christians. So if you run into somebody who says, Jesus saved me, if they know what they're talking about, at some level they are meaning that Jesus has tied their story in to this episode of God rescuing his people across the Red Sea, among other things. This is how God's salvation begins to be defined in the Bible. Let's look at the text. Uh, I'll pray, and then we'll jump into it. Chapter 14, verse 1. Then the Lord said to Moses, Tell the Israelites to turn back and encamp near pi Haharoth between Migdal and the sea. They are to encamp by the sea directly opposite Baal Zelphon. Pharaoh will think, The Israelites are wandering around the land in confusion, hemmed in by the desert, and I will harden Pharaoh's heart and he will pursue them. But I will gain glory for myself through or over Pharaoh and all his army, and the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. So the Israelites did this. When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, Pharaoh and his officials changed their minds about them and said, What have we done? We've let the Israelites go and have lost their services. So he had his chariot made ready and took his army with him. He took 600 of his best chariots along with all the other chariots of Egypt with officers over all of them. The Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, so he pursued the Israelites who were marching out boldly. The Egyptians, all Pharaoh's horses and chariots, horsemen and troops, pursued the Israelites and overtook them as they camped by the sea near Pi-Haharoth, opposite baal Zephon. As Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up, and there were the Egyptians marching after them. They were terrified and cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us here to the desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone, let us serve the Egyptians? It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. Moses answered the people, do not be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance or the salvation the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only be still. Skip ahead to verse 26. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea, so that the waters may flow back over the Egyptians and their chariots and horsemen. Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and at daybreak, the sea went back to its place. The Egyptians were fleeing toward it, and the Lord swept them into the sea. The water flowed back and covered the chariots and horsemen, the entire army of Pharaoh that had followed the Israelites into the sea. Not one of them survived. But the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right and on their left. Let's pray. Father, I pray that your spirit, who I believe inspired these words to be written thousands of years ago, I pray that same spirit would be here. Give us imagination. Give us skill. Guide our hearts as we get ourselves into the story. Motivate our love as we see your son exalted in it and through it as the Bible exalts him. And help us to more urgently long for his return. We pray this in his name. Amen. Let me fill in a little bit of the backstory very briefly. The Bible says that God created everything, including humanity, and it was good. Somewhere along the way, humans started to rebel against God. They started to do things selfishly, to do things their own way rather than God's way. And so sin, this kind of anti-God impulse, entered the world and began to affect, at least in part, everything. Human relationships economies, cultures, ecologies, everything became at least at some level dysfunctional as a result of this rebellion against God that was in every human heart. God set about redressing this problem, putting things back to rights by forming a relationship and making a promise to one family, a guy named Abraham and his wife Sarah and their kid Isaac. And he said, through this family, I'm going to bless all the families of the earth. Fast forward a few generations, and the offspring of Abraham and Sarah and Isaac have now become kind of a, a fledgling nation. And they find themselves, the Israelites, 
enslaved, in captivity, in shackles, serving Egypt, the most powerful nation at that point in the ancient Near East. They're being abused by Pharaoh, this megalomaniac, the most powerful man in the ancient world at the time who had kind of this semi-divine status. And they cry out like anyone who's being abused, anybody in duress, anybody enslaved, cries out. And God remembered the promise he had made to Abraham. He hears their cry, and he sets about rescuing this entire people. The way he does it is to raise up a leader, a guy named Moses. And he tells Moses to confront Pharaoh, this amazingly powerful dictator, and to tell Pharaoh, let God's people go, let them leave Egypt so they can worship the one true God. Of course, Pharaoh resists And so through the course of ten plagues, which systematically show that God of the Bible is superior to all of the the would-be deities of Egypt, eventually Moses convinces Pharaoh to let the people go. So the Israelites leave Egypt hastily. And then our chapter picks up, it's like Pharaoh realizes what's going on here. They're actually leaving for good. They're not coming back. And so he gets together his army to chase them down. And God's, the invisible God, has has made himself sort of visible to his people now in this pillar of cloud or fire. And he guides them out of Egypt on this sort of wandering course, right up to the shores of the Red Sea, this impassable natural object, obstacle. And the Egyptians, with all of their military machinery, these chariots are charging down on them. It's From a military vantage point, disastrous planning. From God's perspective, it's perfect. It's the perfect opportunity when his people can do nothing for themselves to show something about who he is. I think this passage that we've read is making two main points about God. And these are the two main points that become definitive of God's character and of salvation through the rest of the Bible. First one is that God alone is king. Second one is that God alone is rescuer. So I'm going to try to show you how those are built up in this passage for a few minutes, and then we'll move on. First, that God alone is king, that God is superior, that he doesn't have any rivals. Did you notice in verse 4, it says, I will harden Pharaoh's heart and I will get glory through or get glory over Pharaoh, and all the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. That's what that's about. It's about God showing that he is superior to this megalomaniac who called himself a god, who had demanded the fealty and probably worship of God's people as well as of the Egyptians, who had drowned a generation of baby boys among God's people in the Nile River. God says, I'm going to show myself to be king over even Pharaoh, the most powerful dictator. Ask yourself this, how do you take down a bully? Or how do you show yourself to be superior to someone? You beat them at their own game, right? If I beat Legolas at Wii Tennis, it doesn't really count. I've got to beat him at archery, right? In order, you know, okay, a few of you got that. Moving on. Pharaoh enforces his will in the world through his army, the most powerful army of the ancient world, and particularly the spearhead of it is these chariots, like the tanks, the the nuclear arsenal of the day. That's why 14 times in chapters 14 and 15, these chariots come up again and again and again. They're how he scares the world. They're how he enforces his will. How is God going to show himself to be superior to Pharaoh? He's going to show that Pharaoh's chariots are helpless against him. You see that in verse 25. What does God do? He jams up the wheels of these chariots. He disables the Egyptian war machine. That There was their pride and joy. The strength that Pharaoh brandished in the face of any contenders. And God says, not a problem. Not a problem. God's showing himself to be king over Pharaoh. But more than that, he shows himself to be king over even the gods of Egypt particularly the sun god Ra, who was the one who kind of stood behind, the one whose power stood behind Pharaoh. I think that's what's going on 
with this cloud of pillar and of, or sorry, this, this pillar of, of cloud and of light. Have you wondered about that? The fact that at nighttime, this pillar of fire is leading the Israelites so that they can treat nighttime like it's daytime, and the Egyptians who worship the sun god are left there in the dark. Whose God is more powerful? Whose God is supreme? I think that's exactly what's going on when verse 24 says that it's during the last watch of the night, the first watch of the morning. It's as dawn is breaking, right when the Egyptians would be thinking, perfect, Ra is here for us. We're going to win this thing. This is a slam dunk. Just when Ra should be showing up, that's the moment the text says twice when the Egyptians realize that God, the one true God, is fighting on behalf of the Israelites, and they have lost. The God of the Bible is superior to the gods of Egypt, and the gods who stand behind dictators like Pharaoh. It's also showing that God is king even over cosmological and natural forces. I think one of the things that this passage is doing is it's replaying like a highlight reel from Genesis 1 and 2 when God created everything. You remember how Genesis 1 starts? You've got water, a watery expanse, the deep. In the ancient Near East, water and seas in particular were, were associated with chaos and evil. And in Genesis 1, the spirit, also wind in Hebrew, hovers over those waters and then God divides the waters and land, dry land, comes Fourth, in between. That's exactly what's going on here, right? He's replaying this highlight reel. Like, I'm God over Pharaoh, I'm God over the gods of Egypt, but look, I'm also God over nature. And so the Israelites are with their backs against this Red Sea. Moses stretches out his hand, and the wind, or spirit of God from the east, blows over these chaotic waters, and they separate. And dry land comes forth in the middle and God's people are able to walk through to life and rescue. And then just so that we're clear that God's command holds sway over the forces of nature in both directions. When the Egyptians get close, he lifts his hand and the waters resume their level. Engulfing the chariots and the pharaoh and the army who just a few chapters earlier had tried to drown a generation of boys, baby Israelite boys in the Nile River. God alone is king. God alone is the true king. It's interesting that there's this ancient Egyptian inscription which says basically, the one who recognizes the king will be honored, and the one who is traitorous, treacherous to the king will have his corpse thrown into the sea. Isn't it funny that the one who had set himself up as a peer to the one true God, the one who had created a wrecked genocide against a generation of Hebrew boys finds himself floating in the sea as God has exalted the one true king. I think The other point this passage is making, at least as strongly, is that God alone is rescuer. Look at verses 10 through 12. I think that's what's going on here. God has led his people up to the edge of this impassable natural obstacle, the Red Sea. They're ill-prepared. They're few in number compared to Egypt, at least. And this war machine is bearing down on them. They're outrun, they're outgunned, and they are hemmed in. And they're petrified, understandably. I think that's what's going on in verses 10 through 12. They cry out, what have you done to us? Why did you bring us here? They're so helpless, in fact, that they would rather be back enslaved in Egypt. That's how terrible it is. There's nothing that they are able to contribute to their rescue. Nothing they're able to do for themselves at this moment except be needy. And Moses says to them in verse 13, Don't be afraid. Watch. Watch the salvation the Lord is going to work for you. 
Watch him fight your enemies. Watch him defeat your captors. Those Egyptians who have mistreated you, who are hounding you down right now, you will never see them again. All you have to do is be quiet. It's this incredible picture of God alone as rescuer, able to do for these people what they could never do for themselves. I think sometimes when we think of this passage, we envision the Hebrews as these good little God worshipers who had been worshiping him faithfully for generations. That's not the case at all. There's no evidence they've been worshiping God. Presumably, they've been worshiping the gods of Egypt. God didn't have a relationship with the people as a whole at this point. He had made a promise to a family. It's only after this rescue, a few chapters later, at Mount Sinai, when God establishes a real relationship with the entire people in this contract called a covenant. He says, look, trust me because I'm trustworthy. Remember the Exodus? Worship me because see my authority. Obey me because look at my grace. God owed these people nothing. And when they could do nothing for themselves, he stepped in as the only rescuer. I think it's because of these two central attributes of who God is, that he alone is king and that he alone is rescuer, that this story, this episode, becomes the defining, the paradigmatic rescue of God through the rest of the Old Testament. So whenever the Israelites find themselves in desperate situations, in need of rescue, this is what they look back to. Whenever they find themselves needing to remember what God is like, they think back to this. Importantly, though, something happens along the way. Through the voice of the prophets, the people began to understand more and more that their sin is part of the problem. Their own rebellion against God is part of the problem. It shouldn't be any surprise to us that in just a generation, in Joshua chapter 3 and 4, as the people have now crossed the desert and on the brink of entering a new land that is filled with giants and defended by by castles and fortresses, it shouldn't be any surprise to us that at that point they think back to the Exodus and they remember the God who is able to show himself king over Pharaoh and king over Egypt will have no problem showing himself to be king over the Canaanites and the Canaanite gods. And the God who is able to disable Egyptian chariots will have no problem dismantling the fortress of Jericho. And the God who was able to lead us through the middle of the Red Sea on dry ground is going to have no trouble leading us across the Jordan River on dry ground. He alone is king. He's the only rescuer. Shouldn't surprise us then that a few generations later on, as the people are encountering the Philistines in 1 Samuel chapter 4 and 5, that both the Israelites and the Philistines remember this Exodus episode and realize that God is king, that he fights on behalf of his people. And the Philistine idol Dagon falls on his face before the presence of God in the Ark of the Covenant. God rescues his people. It shouldn't surprise us then that hundreds of years later when the people of God once again find themselves as refugees occupied by another superpower, now this time Babylon, that they think back to this episode. When there's nothing they can do for themselves, when they've been stripped of their land and their privileges and their temple and everything, the prophet Isaiah reminds them, chapter 43, the naval war machine of Babylon is no more a challenge for the true God than were the chariots of Egypt. Chapter 51, Isaiah pleads with God on behalf of the people, says, Return, come rescue your people like you did back at the Exodus, when you made a way through the deep, when you opened up in the depths of the sea a way for your redeemed to pass through. You're the rescuer. And at every step along the way when the people needed rescue, they remembered the episode of the Exodus. And through the voice of the prophets, they began to realize more and more that the main enemy from whose grasp they needed rescuing was 
their own sin, their own rebellion against God, which at the end of the day made them no different from the Egyptians or the Philistines or the Babylonians. What enemy is more invincible than the one in the mirror? What disease is more intractable than one that affects the body and the will? began to realize that they needed rescuing from their own sins as well as from external forces. It shouldn't be any surprise to us then that several hundred years after Isaiah, when the people again find themselves occupied by a foreign superpower, and this time called Rome, that in Luke chapter 2, the people are beginning to realize that their sin is part of the problem. The corruption of the leadership, the rejection of God's authority, and now Rome is here occupying them. And in Luke chapter 2, it reminds us that Caesar Augustus, the new dictator, is exerting his power and his power abuse over God's people by issuing a census. And in that same chapter, we shouldn't be surprised that an angel shows up to a bunch of humble shepherds on a hillside and says to them the words that Moses spoke next to the Red Sea. Don't be afraid. Do not be afraid. The Lord's salvation is here. Except this time, instead of the presence of the Lord being made visible in a pillar of fire and of cloud, the presence of the Lord was made visible in a squirming, probably crying baby boy in a watering trough a few miles away. A baby named Yeshua, Jesus, the Lord's salvation. It shouldn't be surprising to us then that seven chapters later in Luke chapter 9, after this Yeshua, this Advent child, has grown to be a man, has started gathering around him people who obey him and believe in him and are following him, it shouldn't surprise us that he goes to this mountain And his inner circle, Peter, James, and John, are with him. Do you remember that bizarre scene? They see somehow Jesus talking to Moses and Elijah, who are long dead. And the whole scene gets lit up. And Jesus is transfigured by heaven's glory. Do you remember what they're talking about? Luke chapter 9, verse 31. Jesus is talking with Moses and Elijah about the departure... The word there is exodus, the exodus that he's about to accomplish in Jerusalem. When Jesus and Moses get together and they start talking about Jesus accomplishing the exodus, when they talk about Yeshua achieving the Lord's exodus in Jerusalem, when they're talking about Jesus' death and resurrection on behalf of his people, his inner circle see him for the first time as he really is. In all heaven's glory, Jesus alone is God and Jesus alone is king. By his perfect life, he begins to unwind this impulse towards rebellion that's in every human heart. By his death, he breaks the shackles of sin and makes peace with God possible. When he accomplishes the exodus by rising to new life, He's proclaiming himself king over death and over the forces of evil and providing a way for life, a way through for eternal life for his people. See, every other time throughout the Old Testament God's people needed rescuing, they understood the rescue that came as an echo of the Exodus. Once you get to this Advent, kid, this Yeshua baby, they realize, they realize, the New Testament writers realize that the exodus he accomplishes, the delivery that he accomplishes for God's people is of such a magnitude that it can't be an echo of anything. Exodus was a preview for this. He's the main event. He alone is God. He alone is king. He alone is rescuer. 
at Advent, as I said earlier, we're looking backwards. We're putting ourselves in the sandals of those shepherds on the hillside, waiting for a Messiah, hearing the angels say, don't be afraid. Waiting with Mary and with Joseph when they say a son is going to be born to you and you're going to call him Yeshua. Waiting in the story with Israel. But we're also ourselves looking ahead to when he comes back. Because the Bible promises he will. If you're a Christian, if like me, you believe in Jesus and you're following him, you're trusting him for your salvation, then you know that he has made peace for you with God. He has made a way for you to have eternal life. But you also, if you have a heartbeat, realize that the forces of evil are still at work. That, as it were, Pharaoh and his armies are not yet engulfed in the sea. You realize, if you have a heartbeat or if you're anything like me, that you still have something of an impulse towards sin, towards rebellion against God in your own heart, and you long for the day when that's gone. If you ever read a newspaper, you realize that there are still people like the Egypt of the Bible and like the Babylon of the Bible and like the Rome of the Bible at work in the world today, megalomaniacs and dictators and power abusers, and there's injustice and there's dysfunction in economies and systems and ecologies, And the Bible promises that Jesus is coming back. And our job this Advent and until he returns is to cry out with urgency like my baby boy Declan does. Believe me, we're going to cry out, come, come Lord Jesus, come back, finish it. We're going to stand alongside our brothers and sisters around the globe who are experiencing the sharp end of systems of injustice, who are facing the pharaohs of today. We're going to cry out with them, come Jesus. Come Jesus, make it so we never see them again. Come bring your rescue. Come free my heart from the impulse towards sin, finish it. The great thing about the Bible is in Revelation, it promises us what the end is going to be like. Revelation chapter 18 says this. It says Babylon. Babylon there is being used as a picture of all the systems of evil in the world, all the dictators, all the injustice, all the evil. And it says an angel of the Lord takes a millstone and he throws it into the sea and it sinks to the bottom of the watery chaos. And he says that, in the final picture, is what happens to evil Forces, they're gone. And then quotes Moses from the side of the Red Sea and says, you will never see these enemies again. How fitting that our God who is able to work salvation for his people on this cosmological, cosmic stage is able to prefigure what he does in his son, Yeshua, thousands of years earlier by rescuing a people out of slavery and across a Red Sea. It's even more fitting, I think, that at the end, in Revelation chapter 21, there is no sea. There's a new heaven and there's a new earth. There is no sea. Even that watery chaos that in the Bible connotes chaos, is the final resting place of evil. Even that succumbs to God's hand and in the end is no more. If you're a sailor or a beach lover like I am, don't worry, I think this is a metaphor. (laughs) But the point is, when Jesus comes back, which he's gonna, when he finishes the story, which he's gonna, those old enemies will never be seen again. And all that will remain on the other side is promised land and joy and peace and no fear and worship of this Advent child, Yeshua, who alone is king and who alone is rescuer. Let's pray. Father, I pray 
that you would use your word to stir our hearts this morning, to stand in solidarity with those of our brothers and sisters around the globe and in this city and in our country who desperately want you to return. Father, would you kindle that own sentiment and urgency in our hearts? Would you fix our gaze on your son who is our savior? We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.